<clears throat> Last week we looked at the life and the reign of Jeroboam, the very first king of the divided kingdom. Of course, he reigned over the kingdom of Judah, and we're going to be talking a little bit more about the divided kingdom, hopefully in our study tonight when we finish uh, with Jeroboam. But in looking at his life and looking at his reign, we begin to look at the lessons, which of course is our primary focus um, in this study, to look at the lessons that we can learn from these individuals. And the first lesson that we noted before our time ran out was that great opportunities are no guarantee of success. And we showed how that Jeroboam had been given a kingdom uh, God had given it to him because of the, uh, the things of which uh, Rehoboam, and, or not Rehoboam, but uh, uh, Solomon did. And this was something that was given to him, and yet we see what he did with it. What wonderful, great opportunity was given him. And we also looked at what it is that we have been given. We saw that we have been given the gift of the Holy Spirit, as Acts 2, verses 38 and 39 teaches. We've been given the gift of eternal life, as we read in Romans chapter 6 and verse 23. And we've also been given the gift of salvation, as expressed in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8. So what truly great gifts are even greater if our perception and uh, priorities of what they need to be, I think we can understand that these are gifts far, far greater than even the gift that God gave to Jeroboam in giving him uh, the nation of Israel. And for that reason, the truly lesson that we need to come away from at this point is to let us always be thankful for God's gifts, and do our very best to serve the Lord faithfully all of the days of our lives. So we looked at that lesson last week. So we come down to this, another lesson that we learned from Jeroboam, and at least from the story concerning Jeroboam, and that is that knowing God's word does not mean that we will obey it. And that was the case of the young prophet that God sent to rebuke Jeroboam for his establishing idol worship, for his putting those idols in Dan and Bethel, telling Israel it's too far for you to go to Jerusalem to worship. Here are the gods that brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And all of the other things involving that worship, the use of every class of individual rather than the Levites as priests to establish it the feast days on the same day of the month but a different month. So all of this we see God sends this young prophet to Jeroboam to rebuke him. And in giving directions, instructions to this prophet, he tells him that he is not to eat or drink or return by the same way that he went. And obviously this young prophet very well understood. He very well heard what God said. He very well understood what God said. Because when he went to Jeroboam and he rebuked him, and Jeroboam offers him food, the prophet says, I cannot eat, I cannot drink, I cannot return the same way. So yes, he heard what God told him. He understood what God told him because in the case of Jeroboam, he made the application. He did not eat. He did not drink. He did go a different way. But then we see the old prophet that hears about him. And he approaches him and stating that the Lord had spoken to him and that he was to eat, to drink, and this young prophet does so. So here was the young prophet. He heard what God said. He understood what God said because he rehearsed it to Jeroboam 
He applied it to Jeroboam in that case. He rehearsed it to the old prophet. So there's no question of his not understanding what the instructions were. And for whatever the reason that he gave in to the old prophet, who knows? It could have been that out of respect. But who should he had more respect for? The old prophet or the instructions that God directly had given to him. But, you know, it doesn't matter how many reasons that we think that justify not doing what God says. There's really only and always one reason to do what God says. And that's because God says it. So we know that what is true of this young prophet the same can hold true for us. But let's not let it be so. You know, I'm convinced that the majority, maybe if not all the time, that we sin. It's not because we don't know what God says. We know what God says. Just, just as this young prophet did. Another lesson that we see is that stubborn selfishness leads to destruction. And truly that was the case with Jeroboam. Had Jeroboam obeyed God, he would have been a great ruler. And he would have had a long line of succession of his family, of his heirs ascending to the throne of Israel. God said that in 1 Kings 11 and verse 38. He, God said, then it shall be, if you heed all that I command you, walk in my ways, and do what is right in my sight, to keep my statutes and my commandments, as my servant David did, then I will be with you and build for you an enduring house as I built for David and will give Israel to you. This enduring house was God assuring Jeroboam that his lineage would continue to inherit the throne after him. And this is what God said you need to do. You need to heed all that I command you. Walk in my ways. Do what's right in my sight. Keep my statutes and commandments. But we know that instead, we read 1 Kings 12, verses 26 and 27. Jeroboam said in his heart, Now the kingdom may return to the house of Israel. If these people go up to offer sacrifices in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then the heart of this people will turn back to their Lord, Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they will kill me and go back to Rehoboam, king of Judah. So we see out of this selfishness, this desire to not only have power, but to make sure that he hung on to that power. And this is what this is all about. It's fear that when Israel goes back to observe the things that God commanded under the law of Moses and go back to Jerusalem, they would stay. And therefore, Rehoboam would have less and less and less as time went on to rule over. So this was his idea, to come up with idol worship, the golden calves, and make this statement that it's too far, it's too much. And we talked about that last week, how that people always have a tendency to lean toward the convenient. And that's exactly what Jeroboam is making it for Israel. He's making it convenient. So a question that we need, I believe, to seriously consider is when we die, will we be remembered for our faithful, faithfully serving the Lord? Will that be what people will remember us by? Will we be remembered as David? who kept the Lord's commandments, who followed the Lord with all of his heart to do only what was right in the eyes of the Lord, to be 
as David was called, a man after God's own heart? Because God evoked the name of David in giving these instructions to Jeroboam. If you be faithful like my servant David, his lineage is going to continue to inherit the throne. Your lineage will do the same in Israel as his is doing in Judah. So will we be remembered as David or will we be remembered as Jeroboam who done things contrary to God's will? And you know, the answer to that question as to whether the way that people will remember us, that can only be shaped and determined by us. Just us individually. No, no other person, just us. What we do in our lives will be what people will remember and what they will think of us when we have passed on from this life. And then another lesson that we see is God will be honored by his people or in their sin, they will be destroyed. Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 29 says, the way of the Lord is strength to the upright. So there we have it. What is our strength? is to do the upright, to do God's will. Then on the other hand, destruction shall be to the workers of iniquity. And we know iniquity is lawlessness. And all that would pertain to Jeroboam and his implementing the worship was lawlessness. It was iniquity. It was totally different from what God would have them to be. How many times have we heard this verse, Proverbs 16, verse 18? Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before fall. You know, that's been true of Rehoboam. It was true of Solomon. It was true of Saul. True of David. True of Israel during the period of the judges. So this, this is something that we see more than once, over and over nearly, with so, so many of these characters that we're studying in the scriptures. And then Romans, here's what God says. God will render to each one according to his deeds. Eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality. But to those that are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, tribulation, and anguish on every soul of man that does evil. So God will be honored if we will honor him. But if we turn against him, then we will be destroyed. We must not be like Jeroboam, because you remember we read that statement in 1 Kings 12, verse, 20, uh, verse 33, that he did that which he had devised in his own heart. That was Jeroboam. And we know that God keeps his word. And we must put our faith in him, not in our own devices. So in what we see a uh, study concerning Jeroboam is that really his story, to sum it all up, is one of lost opportunity. I really don't know of any better way to say it in just as short a form as possible. His story is the story of lost opportunity. Jeroboam benefited from the era of Solomon. He was given a great kingdom 
and told that if he would obey God, he would be blessed, his family would continue to rule over that kingdom. And yet, Jeroboam, like so many others, he threw away a wonderful opportunity. And you can't really look at Jeroboam and ignore that young prophet. Because in regards to the young prophet, we need to remember that any command that God gives is important. And that disobedience to any command of God is rebellion. It, no other word to call it. You know, in our day and age, some would argue that the important element in the command to that young prophet was to rebuke Jeroboam. And whether he ate or drank or returned a different way, that, that's just minor. <laughs> but we cannot, we must not, divide a commandment into what we consider to be major and minor aspects. Don't let anyone convince us that as long as we profess to love God and generally do what's right, that we can ignore the specific details in any of God's commandments. And you know, despite the many warnings that we have in the scriptures, there are many people that will still argue and say, well, you know, it doesn't matter what you believe, just as long as you're sincere. Or they'll say, it doesn't matter what you practice, as long as you're sincere. And yet, it was a matter of life or death, wasn't it, to that young prophet? And as it was a matter of life or death to him, the same is true for us, except a matter of life and death, or death, is heaven or hell. That's what it means to us. That's what's at stake as far as you and I are concerned. So, that is what I had in our study of Jeroboam. And what I want to do, I mentioned to somebody last week, hopefully this will also get me caught up to where next week we can do a fresh start <laughs> on a single character without having to split part of a Bible study, studying one character and the other half of the Bible study another. But I want us to look at the period of time that we are now studying these kings under. Because the divided kingdom, I know to me, it has caused me problems at times. And I can't help but think that for anyone that's, that's doing a, whether it's an in-depth study or whether just a, a casual reading, maybe a Bible reading exercise, I can't help but believe that, that you too have ran upon some things that you kind of wondered about. You had no explanation for them. But I want us to make sure that we get the understanding of the divided kingdom in our minds where it needs to be, the way it needs to be, and then look at why it is that some of the things, some of the aspects about it may be a little, little difficult. Sometimes maybe even to the point of thinking that we've <laughs> run up on a contradiction. So I think that for fear of that being the case, it would be well worth our time to look at some of the things that that we want to talk about. First of all, I want us to just look and make sure we understand geographically what we're talking about. We're talking about the divided kingdom. We're talking about the kingdom of Israel, the kingdom of Judah. We've already talked about one king so far over each one of those nations, each one of those kingdoms. We first looked at Rehoboam, he was the king, first king over the nation of Judah. The one we've just finished, Jeroboam, he was the first king 
over the nation of Israel. And all this has happened now since the reign of Solomon. After Solomon, the kingdom divided, and we'll, we'll have a graph of that in just a minute. But what we're seeing here is this tan area here is the northern kingdom, the kingdom or the nation of Israel. It's to the north. This yellow area is the nation or the kingdom of Judah. So we see one is north, one is south. Now, another thing, since we've looked at Jeroboam, we see that he put up a golden calf in Dan and in Bethel. So we see that Dan is way up in the northern part of the kingdom of Israel. Bethel is close to the border. And I think somebody last Wednesday night, uh, after going out, made the statement that wasn't uh, Bethel pretty close to Jerusalem. Well, there's Bethel, and there's Jerusalem, and there's the boundaries. So yes, Bethel was very close to Jerusalem. But what you can see is how strategically located that Jeroboam obviously was in the placing of those golden calves. This would take people to people, care of people in the northern half of the northern kingdom Bethel would take care of people in the southern part of the northern kingdom, but it would be right on the way before they would get into Judah and go into Jerusalem to worship as God commanded, worship to be done. So hopefully this graph will help us to see the northern kingdom, Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah. To just sort of do a little contrasting, of the two kingdoms. The, as we're saying, Israel is to the north, Judah is to the south. The nation of Israel is made up of ten tribes. That's what God promised when Ahijah came to Jeroboam and took the garment, took his garment, and divided it into twelve pieces to represent the twelve tribes, and he gave ten to Jeroboam and said, you will rule over 10 tribes. So indeed, the nation of Israel is made up of 10 of the tribes of Israel. The nation of Judah is made up of two tribes, namely that of Judah and of Benjamin. But we'll also see as time goes on that there's actually a remnant of all of the 10 tribes that did not go off after Jeroboam and his idolatry. So we, hear, we, have, <clears throat> we have Rehoboam in the southern kingdom made up of two tribes and a, what we might call a remnant of the other tribes. You can see as far as land is concerned, about three times is different. Naturally, more to the land of Israel. The first king we just studied, and by the way, there will be more than one Jeroboam, <laughs> and this is one of those things that makes a study of uh, the Old Testament in the period of the Bradley Kingdom a little bit confusing, and of course, we know that the first king of Judah was Rehoboam. As far as capitals, Israel had three over its period of existence. It had Shechem, as we see, 1 Kings 12, Tirzah, which is 1 Kings 14, and then finally Samaria in 1 Kings 16, before that Israel went into captivity. Of course, Judah always held true to Jerusalem being the capital. As far as the temples, we know that Dan and Bethel, which was originally instituted by Jeroboam, but then later there would be one at Samaria, the capital city of the northern kingdom. But of course, the temple always remained in Jerusalem in the nation of Judah. There were nine dynasties. What I mean by that, 
that they were nine different ruling families through the period of Israel's history. There was only one ruling family in Judah, and that was the lineage of David. So that's what we're saying about Jeroboam. He, <laughs> he had it laid in his lap. If he would have done what God told him to do, it would have been a, a great kingdom, and his lineage, there would not have been nine lineages as they are if he would have remained faithful to the Lord. And then, of course, there were equal number of kings in both the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. As far as looking at the kings, as far as Israel's concerned, they were all bad. And not just were some bad, some were even worse than bad. But there was not a single king, those 20, that reigned in Israel. That was a good king. As far as Judah, it sort of cycled back and forth a lot of times. Good king, bad king. Good king, bad king. But at least there were some good kings in the history of Judah. As far as the duration, Israel remained in existence for approximately 209 years when in 722 BC we see the Assyrians capture the nation of Israel, carries the nation of Israel into Assyrian captivity and Israel never returns. Israel is no longer. As far as the nation of Judah, it lasted some 344 years, but its fail, fall rather, came in 586 when Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians, again, in both of these instances, God's judgment was being brought upon either Israel by the Assyrians or upon Judah by the Babylonians. But I'm sure we're all familiar with Nebuchadnezzar and the carrying of Judah, but Judah does return. Judah returns from captivity. Israel does not. And I think, and I hope that we all know why Judah returned from captivity. There was the fulfillment of a promise that hadn't yet been fulfilled. And that, we go back to Abraham. <laughs> Abraham and of his seed would be a great nation. To his seed would be given a great land. But of his seed, all nations of the earth would be blessed. And God has reaffirmed that promise through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. He reaffirmed it to David. And so this is why we're seeing that Israel never comes out of captivity. Judah does because of the fulfillment of that promise having not yet been fulfilled. Now, in looking at the, well, let's, let's look at one more consent since we're dealing with the kings. The king that reigned the longest in Israel was Jeroboam II. We'll be getting to him a little bit later. He reigned 41 years. As far as, Manasseh, uh, as far as Judah, Manasseh was the one that reigned the longest. He reigned 55 years. The shortest reign in Israel was Zimba. He only reigned seven days. In Judah, the shortest was Jehoahaz. Jehoahaz, he reigned for three months. The last king that reigned in Israel was Hoshea. And the last king that reigned in Judah before Nebuchadnezzar, claim was uh, Zedekiah. Now, as I said a moment ago, there's some difficulties in studying the time period of the divided kingdom. And there's several reasons for that. That we need, not that we understand them, sometimes they get a little deep, a little, <laughs> a little too deep for me. But just, just for the basis of our understanding and seeing why, 
that there are difficulties that we might run across in our study or in our reading. There is an alternating timeline pattern through this period. <laughs> there are a lot of names to remember. And along the line of there being many names, different kings had similar names. And I mean it just by the spelling of one or two letters in their name. You almost think you're reading about the same king, but it's not. The difference of that one or two letters in the name makes the difference in the king. But, <laughs> at the same time, different kings did have the same name. So you, you see what I'm saying? That it can get difficult in studying the divided kingdom. And here's another one. Sometimes the same king had different names. So all of these things together can make it somewhat a little confusing. And so the noticeable difference really is, I think for the most part, in the timeline that we're dealing with in this period. Many of the details of time in the Bible do seem to be contradictory. In fact, totals are sometimes not the same. From one fixed point in the history of Israel and Judah to another fixed point in the common history. And there appears to be differences between the time line and the length of which some kings reigned. So there is where some difficulties we might run into. So always, whenever we run into these difficulties, it, it's important that we ask, when did a king begin counting the years of his reign? Sometimes that was the factor that makes for the difference of what seems to be a contradiction when there isn't. When did the calendar year begin? This, this is an important one that we do need to always keep in mind when we study these two, two nations, these two kingdoms, the calendar year, when it began. And what method of reckoning was used by each nation when referring to the dates of the other nation? So we're dealing with two nations here, but yet sometimes they make a reference to the other nation, and yet there is again that reckoning of time that seems to be contradictory, but yet it's the method that they're using that doesn't make it a contradiction whatsoever. And do, the, do any of the reigns overlap for some reason? That can cause confusion. Because there were several kings in both Israel and Judah, the, the reigns overlap. They both reigned at the same time for whatever the reason that we're going to be seeing here in just a moment. And were there any periods of time between the reign of one king ending and the next king starting to reign? Sometimes it wasn't just a, a seamless going from one administration into the other, there was some time period. That makes for the differences in time. And was the same method of dating that used throughout the nation's history? Well, this is where you get kind of deep because the answer to that question is no. As time changed through those three, four hundred years, those nations sometimes change the way they reckoned time. So that has to be always given consideration to. And what about the absolute dates? What absolute dates can be used to calculate the years that each individual king reigned? 
So all of these are important questions, and that shows us how important it is that we understand this timeline. As I said a moment ago, different calendars were used by Israel and Judah. Israel's new year began in Nisan. And Nisan corresponds to the end of September and the beginning of October as far as our calendar is concerned. But that was Israel's new year. Judah's new year was in Tishri. That corresponds to the latter part of March and the first part of April in our year. And here's a little diagram I think that may help us to visualize it. This outer ring is our calendar. Our calendar starts in January and goes through December. Well, here is the new year for Israel. As I said, the latter part of March, first part of April. Here is the new year for, for Judah. The latter part of September, first part of October. So when you start studying one nation and you start looking at time and then you start going to a king of another nation, then you're looking at two different time periods as far as the reckoning of time is concerned. So each nation used its own method of referring to the reign of kings and referring to time when it involved the other nation. And there's a number of simultaneous reigns, two kings reigning at the same time. An example of this is, for instance, Asa and Jehoshaphat. We'll be studying Asa in next week's lesson, hopefully. But Asa became gravely ill, but he was still king. But yet Jehoshaphat was also king because of Asa's illness. The same was true with Jehoshaphat and Jehoram. There was war, Jehoash and Jeroboam II. There was always an imminent threat of war that caused these two to reign together. Then there was leprosy on the part of Azariah that caused simultaneous reigns with Jothan. Ahaz was involved in a Assyrian uh, rebellion. And therefore we have two kings reigning at the same time then. And Hezekiah and Manasseh because of the illness of Hezekiah. So there were a lot of simultaneous, and this isn't all of them, but we see why. It was illness, it was war, it was whatever the case might have been that caused two kings to be reigning at the same time. And this last slide is to help us see where we've been and where we're at. We've looked at Saul, the first king, when the children of Israel no longer wanted to be judged by God or the judges that he appointed. So they said to Samuel, give us a king. We want to be like the other nations. So Saul was the first one, David was the second, Solomon was the third. And because of the things that Solomon did, we see the kingdom divides. And so far in our study, we've looked at Rehoboam, the first king of Judah, and we finished tonight our study of Jeroboam, who was the king of Israel. And Lord willing, tomorrow, not tomorrow, but next week, we hope to look at Asia. And of course, with Asia, we're going to be seeing he is the third king in the divided kingdom because some of these kings are like judges. <laughs> There's just not very much said about them. So we're not going to be going through every single king of both Judah and Israel. It just depends on the king and what the scriptures tell us about it. So tomorrow... <laughs> Next Wednesday night, we're going to look at Asa, and he will be the third king of the nation of Judah. So we'll be going back to that. Hope this has been of help. Hope it has. Appreciate so much your attention, and we'll...
give way to uh, part of the worship period. <laughs>